Lord forgive me for this trap shit Sergeant Smack make it backflip Telly Hank it with the action With the vital speaking Spanish Frank Matthews how I vanish Poof. Came back like I'm King Tut Go BBS is on a beamer When Fat Cat was tearing queens up Fall off the prop and not the re-up Fly like Puerto Rican Jesus Uptown like I'm Baby Mane Just caught a touchdown from the bay Sometimes parts of New York look more like a B-feature film set than somewhere for people to live, like the South Bronx, a backdrop to incessant drama for the firemen of Ladder 31 and Engine 82. The fire statistics for New York are staggering. New York has more fires than Chicago, Detroit, Los Angeles and Philadelphia put together. The New York Fire Department responds to nearly a quarter of a million calls a year, three times as many as the London Fire Brigade. And the busiest district is the South Bronx, where last year the men from Battalion 27 responded to more than 10,000 calls. On average, that's one every 45 minutes, night and day, every day of the year. Few would challenge their claim to be the busiest fire station in the world. In the 1980s, fires would incinerate the Bronx, leaving behind a haunting landscape of charred ruins and scattered lives. The Twin Parks fire, claiming 17 souls, echoed a history of relentless blazes, culminating in a 1981 film, Fort Apache, The Bronx, and eventually the infamous 1990s Happy Land Social Club fire that took 89 lives. Amidst the devastation, families in the South Bronx faced daily challenges of decay, arson, and neglect as the borough would grapple with its darkest hour from the ashes emerge not only ruins, but a breeding ground for some of the era's most notorious drug kingpins. I mean, if I was getting that kind of money, I was spending it just as quick as I was getting it. You know what I'm saying? Like, sometimes you don't stack money. You're getting this coming quick, you spend it quick. What are you, two, you're 20 now. What, what age are you? Yeah, I was, I was, on, I was 20. I, okay. You know, them people came to get me. I was 21 going on 22. Wow, you were young. Fast brother. came down. Yeah, I'm the youngest besides George, boy George. President Carter will be in New York today to address the convention of the National Urban League. In remarks prepared for delivery there, Mr. Carter says that he will propose a program shortly which will ensure that equal opportunity means equal economic opportunity for the disadvantaged. Mr. Carter isn't the only candidate to court the Urban League and the black vote. Ronald Reagan is doing it too, as Derek Blakely reports. The day-long effort to court the black vote began in New York before the National Urban League, where Reagan appealed to skeptical delegates to look beyond his conservative label and add his proposals for job and urban revitalization. To demonstrate his concern, the Republican nominee traveled to the South Bronx, where rampant urban blight has left dozens of city blocks a virtual wasteland. In a shouting match with residents, many of whom demanded jobs, Reagan replied, I can't do a damn thing for you if I don't get elected. Is there more jobs coming through the Bronx for us? For I've been asked a few questions down here. I'd like to try and answer them. All right. Let's hear what the man got to say. Please. Shut up. Let's Shut the fuck up. up. Shut out. I came here Shut out. because almost three years ago, President Carter came down to this very spot and he announced a great plan for building houses for 27,000 people, building industries to provide jobs, really taking care of the entire thing, about a billion and a half dollar plan. It is three years. What are you going to do? Wait a minute. It is three years and nothing has been done. Please, wait a minute. Let them in. I'll get there. 
<laughs> but you don't need Bring to speak. It. Just tell us and we'll be happy we go home. All right. All right. Let him, let him. Now that was almost three years ago, and today the president blames the local officials, the mayor of the city, and others, and says they called it off. What are you going to do? Well, Right now, right now, right now in Congress, is some, I'm trying to tell you. I am trying to tell you that I know now there is no program or promise that a president can make Thank that the federal you. government can in, come in so and wave a wand and do this. Yes, there is legislation in Congress, legislation for cooperation between government, between the private sector, and using tax incentives to give the people who will take jobs, the people who will come in here and build businesses, that will give them an incentive to come in because they'll get a tax break while they are putting those businesses and getting them established to, to provide jobs. What can you? Now, I support. I support that kind of legislation. And I've got a record as governor of California in which we didn't try to buy things by the government route. We used the people, and we got jobs for the people in the private sector, the kind of jobs that have got a future. We're asking you for help now Mr. 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 And Charter Street is popping. But I can't do it. Mr. Not by yourself, but you can put a word in court. I'm not going to hit him. Are you crazy? Mr. Look, if you will listen for a minute, what I'm trying to tell you is I can't do a damn thing for you if I don't get elected. No, but Anthony, what are you going to do anyway? We'll make promises to I just to finished it. telling you and you wouldn't stop talking to listen. Well, no, you can't listen to everybody else. If things was that hard, we're full-fledged adults who probably has skills, were begging for jobs? How hard y'all think it would be on a ninth grade dropout heading into the mid 80s? The wonder drug, crack, would turn the largest housing projects in the Bronx into one of the most dangerous places in New York City. Explaining Edenwall to a New York Times reporter in an article from 1989, one resident would say, when I first moved here, it was a nice project, a good place to live. Now we have shootings. People have even been robbed here. We find people shooting up or smoking the stuff in the hallways. The article, titled Constant Reality in a Project, Fear of a Violent Drug Gang, it would explain a scenario as an invasion of drug dealers that would cause the number of crimes in Edenwall to more than double in the five-year period from 1984 to 1989. According to NYCHA statistics, the number of assaults would go from 66 in 1984 to 149 just four years later in 1988. The larcenies and robberies would triple over that same period. Before 1985, it was said that Edenwall would have one or two murders a year, usually stemming from domestic violence disputes, but since 1986, when crack would first be discovered in Edenwall, 11 people would end up being killed, with eight of them in gunfights that were set off by drug disputes. According to the NYPD, in the year of 1988, all four of the people that were killed in Edenwall projects would die in drug-related shootouts. The violence would even escalate more in January of 1989, when five men would be wounded in a drug turf war inside of the project. Just three months after that, in March of 1989, another man would be shot eight times in a similar drug dispute, just a few hundred yards from where the five other people were shot just weeks earlier. In response to the shooting, the NYPD will form a 16-officer narcotics task force 
in February of 1989. The group would be headed by Lieutenant David Curvis, who would describe the 61 building project of Eden Wall as similar to the Wild Wild West. Todd, well, I started selling, but once you started using it, who, you didn't want to sell it no more. You ended up using it, and I messed, I fucked up the now, package. Now we, I fucked up some money, and my man that put me on, he was like, yo, I can't fuck with you no more, and he just, just put me... So you when know, you, I, I was just, like, stressed out for, for a minute. But when you first got it, People were still looking for me for it, and I'm over here, don't even have it, because I, I jacked off my package. I'm keeping real, I jacked off the package, and then, like, dudes were looking for me still, and I was saying to myself, damn, I still got the clientele for this. You know, we're talking about New Year's of, of, of no, we're not, I'm talking about tail in 86. Tail in 86. Tail in 86, because 87 is, you know, is when I really was like, yo, I'm gonna go, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm gonna get off them and start getting on my feet again. Did you do it on your own? No help to get off the drug? Like, I never took, I never went into any program or nothing like that. How did? What was you? What was you? You just said I'm just gonna stop. Yeah, my my baby. No mom, girl, no baby girl. mom. At the time before we had a kid, but right around that time, she was like, "Listen, man, you know, um, I can't be with you." You're gonna be doing that, like everybody talking about you, this and that, and that. And I said, I'm gonna get on, I'm gonna get on my feet. And then one day I just was like, that's it. And this what age you? You're younger too. This yeah, is. Yeah, I, I was like 17. Let me see, 87. I was um talking about 80s, 86. Yeah, I was. I was just turned 19. I had 50 dollars. I started with 50 dollars, and wait. I never looked back. Wait. How'd you get the fifty dollars? Where'd you get the fifty dollars? I sold the radio, my girl's radio. Wait a minute. I sold it, and they thought I was gonna smoke that fifty. And I took that fifty. I hopped on the train. I didn't pay back then. You could hop on the train. No camera. Yeah, no problem. Cop my chase. I hopped on the train, went all the way downtown, caught me five bottles, came uptown. Sold them for twenty. Went next day. Bought ten. Wait. Twelve. So that means that means that going. means the radio. You got fifty. You sold those got bottles. Got radio I'm, back too. After a couple a month later, you bought it back for double the price. Here you go. Let me get that. I had. Well, I had. Uh, my money was up in a month. A month. I was pushing that maximum by by March. You lying. After being stabbed in the neck at fifteen hopping off the porch with his little wee hustle and damn near becoming a victim to the same drug that would make him rich and eventually get him convicted. By his 20s, Guito was the man in Edenwall and his 41st crew were running their section of the huge projects. Not to say that Guito and his crew were responsible for the blood that would fall in Edenwall, but Lieutenant David Curvis and his task force would take over the ground floor of the building 1132 East 229th Street, just a few doors away from Guito's building at 1141. And just between the middle of February 1989 to the end of March, the task force would arrest 380 people on drug charges, with most of them being between the ages of 16 and 21. The task force's strategy was to bring on an onslaught on the low-level dealers that would help force the leaders of the 41 crew into the open to sell drugs themselves due to the lack of workers, due to them constantly being arrested during this period of time. Guito would eventually be arrested on April 27, 1989, just a few weeks before Boy George's arrest in May of that year. The feds would eventually step in and take over the case, but they would use many of the task force's witnesses and surveillance records. In court, it would come out that the notorious 41st crew would be headed by a 22-year-old by the name of George Guito Salvia. The government would allege that the group sold about $20,000 worth of crack every single day out of just one building in the huge housing projects located at 1141 East 229th Street. Essentially, they would turn the building into a giant crack den with addicts loitering the hallways and drug deals being made in the lobby, according to the indictment and housing authority police. 
the feds would end up confiscating seven luxury cars that belonged to the gang members and $230,000 in cash, as well as an arsenal of artillery that would include a shotgun, several semi-automatic handguns, a military-style assault rifle, and even a hand grenade. With the overwhelming evidence that the feds had and advice from older OGs, Guito would cop out to a plea. Originally, he was supposed to be sentenced to anywhere between 27 to 34 years, but the judge would drop two points off of his sentence for him accepting responsibility and taking the plea. He would be released from Fort Dix in New Jersey in 2006 or 2007 or so, and he would come home and become sort of a celebrity personal trainer with some of his most notable clients being Jim Jones and Chrissy. But it was really sad while doing my research, I would see people that seemed close to him online sending out R.I.P. tributes around 2018 or so. I'm not sure of the specifics or not even sure if it's true, but if so, it's sad. Now, don't get me wrong. I know what you get when you play the game, but to fight your way through the ashes as a kid and then finally come up in your very early 20s just to be locked up and have to serve time to your mid 40s then die by your 50s y'all make sure y'all hit the red bell and subscribe button right under this video so y'all know when this real trill spill shit is dropping y'all get in the comment box below y'all let me know what cities we need to go to what stories we need to tell what we missed what we got wrong all of that y'all make sure y'all tapping with me directly on instagram twitter pop underscore a underscore lot and until our next jug Y'all know how we play it. Shays Pablo. Salute the almighty mob.